chapter 2 tonight. Isaiah chapter 2. What does wheel mean? What is the word W E A L? Wheel. Joy? Yeah. We need to reintroduce it so I don't wonder every time that I sing moment by moment by wool or by wheel. I just wonder. Is that a bad spelling for a circle and shape or is it what's the deal? Wheel. How do you know what wheel means? A red swollen mark left on the flesh by a blow. That's well, sort of joyous. It rhymes with squeal. And eel. <laughs> Or a deal. Deal. Or a seal. Okay. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 2. That's a great song. There you go. I was thinking uh, I should have had that as one of our worship songs when we were in that <clears throat> portion of Romans where we were talking about dying with Jesus. Yes, dying with Jesus, new life back in mind. And you wonder what the author, what passage of Scripture he had in mind when he was writing that song, well, of course, it would have been Romans 6. Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but not alive unto God. And uh, so, excellent song. I really appreciate it. But I didn't want to know what wheel meant. I appreciate Google and its help. What's that? Google said it's a red streak or sore or something like that. Is that right? Where is it? Well, technically, definition huh? number two is which is best for oh, someone. Oh, I don't have my phone with me. I do have... Wait, it's what? I said definition number two is which is best for someone or something. Okay. Best for something or something. This is a controversy. Could be either. <laughs> Could be either. Yeah, it would fit. Either would fit. Actually, it would be wellness or prosperity, well-being. Wellness, prosperity, well-being? Is that what you said, Charlie? Yeah. Is that what Webster said? Yeah. Hmm. So you got your dictionary first, huh? This has zero to do with the message this evening. <laughs> primary sense of wheel is strength, soundness from the sense of training, stretching, or advancing. A sound state of a person or a thing, a state which is prosperous or at least not unfortunate, not declining, prosperity or happiness. As, here's it in a sentence. As we love the wheel of our body, of our souls and bodies, and then the wheel or woe in thee is placed. This is another sentence. So we say the public wheel, the general wheel, and the wheel of the nation or state. That sounds like a southern accent. For, what? It's the opposite of woe. Opposite of woe, yeah. And that's that's how you were defining it, basically, when you defined it at first. It's a republic, state, but then the mark of a stripe Sign signifies a what or a force. It's found in names as well. From, yeah, but that's weird. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that sound more like wealth, though? I don't know. Well. Welt? A welt. Uh, <laughs> I was just reading the definition. There'd be opposites that are laid out. So here we go. Isaiah chapter 2. <laughs> Let's read verses 1 through 5 tonight and get right into the text. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk 
in the light of the Lord. Our Father, please help us tonight to see what You're going to do in the future. And God, Your plan to involve Your people, the nation of Israel, in it. God, I pray as well this evening that You would help us to focus tonight on the opportunity that we have to say to people, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's a passage of Scripture that is almost word for word or is word for word in Micah chapter 4. As a matter of fact, I'll turn over to Micah and read it to you real quickly. In Micah chapter 4, verses uh, 1 through 2, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, <clears throat> and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will teach us of His ways, and we will walk in His paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 3, And He shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And, their, and the nation shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts have spoken it. The Bible says, For all people will walk every one in the name of his small g God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. And so we see a similar passage in Micah to Isaiah, almost, almost identical language, almost word for word. It's interesting when you read commentaries who try to explain similarities in the Scripture. You know, it's interesting that people who don't want to believe the Word of God look for contradictions in the Scripture. And people who don't want to believe the Word of God look for similarities in the Scripture. And both of those they do in order to discredit that it comes from God. So when uh, the Word of God would say one thing in an area and maybe uh, it would seem to say something else in another area, they want to say, hey, it isn't a perfect book. It isn't the Word of God. And we found from looking at the Scripture that it is a perfect book and that it is the Word of God. And then individuals at the same time will say, well, you know, Mike, uh, you know, maybe he plagiarized or he got what he said from Isaiah. They were overlapping prophets in Israel and Judah, and they would have lived at the same time, Micah and Isaiah, but Micah would have come after or later than Isaiah. So they would have had an overlapping ministry, but Micah would have been the younger of the two prophets. So Micah would have been copying in the prophecy the Lord gave him what Isaiah said is what people would argue. And they forget that the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so the same God who told Isaiah what to say and what to write is the same God who told Micah what to say and what to write. And it is not striking or unusual that they said the same thing because it's the same God that said it. In other words, this is another place in the Scripture that points to the evidence that this is God speaking. This is the Word of God speaking. This is not Isaiah and some notions he has about an ideological future for Judah. This is God telling Isaiah what he's going to do in the future of the world. And I want to look at some things in this passage of Scripture that are notable and applicable this evening. So look down with me in chapter 2 of Isaiah. And verse 1, the Bible says the word that Isaiah the son of Amos the saw, uh, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So geographically we know where we're being where we're talking about. Jerusalem is in Judah. Judah, what we know, would be part of the two tribes that didn't go with Israel, uh, or with that didn't become to be called Ephraim or Samaria when the kingdoms of Israel were divided between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And Jerusalem would have been in Judah. One of the first things that Jeroboam did when the nation, when the, the kingdom of Israel was divided, one of the first things that he did was set up places for alternative worship, places to worship God, high places to worship God instead of the Jerusalem. But Jerusalem was the city, the city, the Zion, that place where uh, God would speak. And we're going to see some things in the text this evening that are notable and uh, are not just not only prophetic, but, but speak of a wonderful future. Here is 
a future event beginning at verse 2. The Bible says, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Now, when we use the term the last days, in the New Testament we come to understand that we are in the last days now. And this would, of course, be the latter of the last days. This would be the, probably we would assume from the events that are described here, the days after the church age. The world right now is not going to Jerusalem, are they, uh, to worship God? Jews are not going today to Jerusalem to worship God. I'll be honest with you, politically speaking, one of the things that helps me to understand that the Jerusalem of today is not anything significant prophetically is the fact that they have not built a temple there. You say, Pastor, they can't build a temple there. No, my friend, um, any people who believes that the only way to God is through the temple in Jerusalem would be a people who would die before they would allow a temple not to be erected in Jerusalem. Isn't that so? I mean, literally, if that temple were a necessary, important part of your worship and you believe God wanted it, uh, would you allow it to not, Would you allow a mosque? Would you allow a Catholic church to be built in the place where that temple is? Not in your life, my friend. Not in your life at all. And it's one of the things I believe that is symbolic most of all that Judaism today is a fake religion is that, that they do not have a temple. And don't let the significance of that, don't let anyone escape the significance of that truth. You say, Pastor, there's a temple institute. They've rebuilt the furniture of the temple. And they're just waiting until the temple is built. Yeah, but they need to build a temple. You see. And I'm not saying that they've been commanded to do so. I'm merely pointing out the truth. Good, I was hoping you'd be here. They are merely, I'm merely pointing out the truth that a people who believe that's the correct way to worship God would either build the temple or die trying to have it built. And I'm speaking for myself. If that were what I believed, I'd, do, I'd act on what I believe. You know, I cannot get into the heart of any person and accurately say that I know what a person believes. I recognize that many Christians know things are true and yet they don't act on them, right? Let me give you some for instances. Does God answer prayer? Yes. Do you believe that? Do you always pray? I would not argue that a Christian who does not always pray doesn't believe in prayer. But there's something going on in the heart of the person. You understand that? In other words, I'm not saying you're not a Christian. Now, I know people that preach say, well, you're not a Christian if you don't pray. Well, that's not what I'm saying this evening. I'm trying to simply point out that sometimes what we believe and what we do are not exactly consistent. Okay? What? What you just said, like, I don't think that's true. Because when you was like, um, Christian will always pray and believe in prayer. Something like that? No, the, what I said, what the question I asked was, does God answer prayer? <clears throat> That's the first question. Does God answer prayer? Yes, yes He does. So I'm, talking about, I'm talking about supernatural. I'm not talking about coincidental. You know, a lot of people pray for things that, that are coincidental or likely so that they can you know, give God a little room you know, in case He's not going to answer prayer. They can at least believe He did. You know, but I'm talking about things that are impossible, things that you know God wants, and things that are the things that are uh, also impossible. Have you ever prayed for something that's not possible, and God answered the prayer? Does the Bible say that we ought to pray for things that are impossible? And the answer is yes. But do Christians always pray? All right. How many of you this evening don't do it? But how many of you would raise your hand and say, "I pray enough." I mean, as God knows my heart, I couldn't do more. Right? You understand the question? Yeah, no, you could always you could always pray more, you could always witness more, you could always be more for Jesus. Okay, but having qualified and said that, a person who believes that the only legitimate way to worship God is through the temple, and the only way to have sacrifice and forgiveness of sin is through the temple. If a person really believed that, my friend, they build a temple. You know, the nation of Israel is a nuclear power. They're a nuclear nation. And so a lot of the nations that threaten Israel are trying to have the same power, but um, Israel is either the greatest or the second greatest military force on the planet. 
they're either the greatest or the second greatest military force on the planet. You say, Pastor, I don't, I don't know that. They're such a tiny, small nation. My friend, um, they have technology and weapons and military that are really second to none, that are very disproportionate for the size of their nation. Israel could destroy any nation in the earth. I'm just talking about, humanly speaking, what they could do. Uh, you look at the Six-Day War, you look at 1948 when Israel fought. I'm telling you, there's nobody that fights like Israel. So if they wanted the Temple Mount, if it were important for them to worship God collectively, nationally, they'd have it. Now, that's my opinion. And I think it's a sound one. Does anybody disagree with my opinion? I don't care if you do. I'm just curious. Uh, I just I don't think if it were important to national Israel that the temple would be unbuilt. Now I said all that to say this. Now look at Isaiah chapter two and verse one, and look what the Bible says. Isaiah the son of Amos saw this word concerning Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. I believe that the Scripture here is written literally and is to be understood literally. God is going to do some things when He deals with national Israel that are going to shake things up. Uh, you know, the Muslims are doing some things to defile the temple, you know. They, they're doing things to, to defile the gates of Jerusalem. They're, they're plant, they have graves and cemeteries because they know that that makes an area, a site, unholy or unclean so God can't use it. But you know what God's going to do with the Temple Mount? He's going to make it the highest point on earth. He's going to exalt it above the hills. And so, whatever rubbish is around the temple is when it comes shooting out of the earth, when that Temple Mount, if you will, erupts to become the highest point point the highest loftiest hill, the hill above the hills on earth it's going to be one of those things that can be seen for miles and I promise you just the trajectory of the slope going up to it is going to make it so that nothing that would defile it would be anywhere near so I'm not trying to paint some new picture or come up with something brand new this evening but it's very 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 plain in the scripture that the Bible says that it's going to be established in the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills. How many of you have seen a very high mountain, a distinctively high mountain? Most of us have, right? Uh, I've seen Mount McKinley in, in um, or what do they call it? Uh, what are the, La the Eskimos Denali. called? Denali. Yeah, uh, in, in Alaska. Well, I haven't seen the tip of it, but I've seen the part where it goes into the clouds. And I mean, it's just standing up way above it. I went to Alaska some years ago. It's been more than 10 years ago now. And I was with there with a, uh, a fellow who's a pilot. And he offered to fly me around Mount McKinley. I said, no, thank you. I had a choice between going to a small village or going to fly around Mount McKinley. I said, no, thank you. And I said, you know, I can see it from here. <laughs> it stood up. I mean, it was one of those things that was just, you know, it was so distinctive that you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm sure it'd be neat to see it up closer, but you could see it from forever away because it was so much higher than the mountains around it. Melissa and I went to Yellowstone this last uh, fall, and we, when we left Yellowstone, we left out of the northeastern gate, I guess, that goes into Montana, and we went over Beartooth uh, Pass. And when you're leaving Beartooth Pass, you literally are just climbing and climbing and climbing and climbing until you come to the top of this mountain range. And then you're driving on a ridge of mountains. Like it's like if you, as though you summit on mountains and the highway goes across the ridge. And as you look behind you, you see this mountain which is shaped like a bear's tooth. And it stands up above all the other mountains behind you. And it's called Bear Tooth Pass, I assume because of the bear tooth shaped mountain, I think would be why. Um, and this mountain, this place where the temple of the Lord is, will someday be exalted to the place that the highest place on earth would be the place where God is worshipped. And I believe that will be the time when, uh, well, I don't want to get into the future events too much because of our passage this evening, but I want to focus tonight 
in verse on verse 3. Look at the response of what's going to happen. All nations shall flow unto it, the Bible says. So first, I should have said look at verse 2 first. The first characteristic we see about this the Lord's house being established in this mountain is that it becomes the place that the nations of the earth come unto. God is the God of all nations, and I do believe that this would certainly uh, be prophetic of the same thing that is described in Hebrews chapter 12. Let me read Hebrews 12 to you. This is uh, urging the Hebrew Christians not to go back in their faith and to consider what they have. In verse 18, the Bible says, For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burn with fire, nor in the blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And it's, if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. Verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn which are written in heaven, and to the God the, and God to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now do you remember when the children of Israel were exiting from Egypt and Moses went up into the mountain? Do you remember this? And the, and the mountain was black and there was fire and there was smoke and the people were terrified of it and they said, Moses, you talk to God. We don't want to come near to the presence of God. And so while they stayed away from the presence of God, they built a golden calf and began to worship it instead of God. But there's a contrast here between the mountain where God's presence literally causes men to fear and to shake and to quake and this mountain where God's presence is, where the house of the Lord is, where the nations of the earth come to it. And friend, I want to remind you that the reason this mountain has this characteristics is because of what Jesus Christ did when He died on the cross for our sins. See, the fact of the matter is when Moses went up into the mountain and God gave him the law, that same law condemned men and caused men to fear God. That was the first, one of the first covenants with God and Israel. And here we are seeing, my friend, the new covenant. The new covenant where the nations will be able to go to the God whom Israel feared. And all the nations will access God in that holy mountain, that holy place. And my friend, if it does not thrill you to the, to the very marrow that God has taken His holy presence, which would cause men to quake and to fear, and literally because of the work of His Son, made it so that we say, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. God has gone from being the judge of the wicked whom we are to our Heavenly Father. Then you miss the significance of the sacrifice of the cross of Jesus on Calvary. And here we see a picture in Isaiah that is prophesying a new covenant. Let's look at that same covenant in Jeremiah, if you'll permit. If you look over one book of the Bible, Jeremiah chapter 31 this evening. Jeremiah chapter 31 and uh, verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. It's an easy one to remember. If it was a caliber of a, of a, of a uh, rifle or something, that would be better. But uh, like a 31 on 31 or something. But it's 31, 31 of Jeremiah. And it's a passage of Scripture that you ought to know because you ought to know that we're living in the days of a new covenant. That God promised Israel that the covenant uh, that they had broken, that He's going to fulfill the promises that He has, but even though they've broken the covenant, He's going to give them a new covenant. And I love it that the new covenant was one that they would be able to bear. The old one was one that they could not. In verse 31 of Jeremiah 31, the Bible says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts, and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And here we see in Isaiah or in Jeremiah 31, 
the same incident being referred to where all the nations are going to come to the Lord. Every man is going to be on the way to the temple. And this is the way it was, I'm told that it was when you would go up to the temple of Jerusalem. Individuals that would be making their journey to the temple. And the men were supposed to appear before God at least uh, three times a year. And as you would be going up the road toward the temple, as people would see you, you'd say, come on, let's go to the temple. Let's go to the temple. It'd be neat, wouldn't it, if we had a procession to church on Sunday morning. Now, I know it's not the temple, but it'd be kind of fun, wouldn't it? When I was a kid, I remember my dad organized some church special days. And he had old car Sunday. Everybody that had an old car went around and picked up people and brought them in their old cars. And we had Bicycle Sunday, and we all met about a mile from the church and rode our bicycles to church on Sunday. And we, you know, so we had different ways of transportation Sunday. It'd be kind of fun if we had a transportation Sunday here, wouldn't it? We don't know if we have enough scooters to go around, but we could show up with some pretty neat style around here. Uh, but, you know, I remember going, and, and uh, you know, it'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it, if everybody that were going to go to church in Fort Lauderdale Baptist would maybe start somewhere. And as you go down the street, as you go down the avenue, maybe just drive down some, some streets where people live, and just say, hey, come on with us. We're going to church. Let's go. We're going to the house of the Lord. Come on with us. And this is exactly what is happening. Literally, people are going to be going up into the house of the Lord. And, you know, if you ever have free time and you have somebody you like a lot, uh, if you have a friend or somebody whose house is always open, um, I had a friend in high school uh, or really when I was in college, and his parents just always had an open door. They always just, they wanted people to come over. And so, you know, uh, people, you say, hey, Ryan, what are you doing? I'd say, oh, I'm going to go over to Nathan's house. And, oh, yeah, you want to come? Yeah, sure. And we'd, I mean, by the time we get to Nathan's house, there'd be 15 or 20 of us. And sometimes it'd be my house, you know, and uh, I have to make sure it's okay with my mom, but she, she liked to have all my friends to come over to our house. And, what are you doing? Well, I'm going to go... My mom's doing this. We're gonna, I'm going to play Monopoly. We'd go play Monopoly. It's a mature, interesting thing to do. And, uh, well, you want to go? Pretty soon, boy, everybody, hey, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And uh, it, it turned into an event. You know, it was just one or two of us are going to go or do something. And this is literally the way it is with the nations of the earth. Here is the Mount God's house where God is, God's presence is. And people are saying, I'm going to go up to the house of the Lord. Where are you going? I'm going up to the house of the Lord. Oh, why don't you come with me? Okay. And the Bible says the nations of the earth are going to go up to the house of the Lord. And my friend, here we see fellowship. Before we saw that we're not come to a mount that's like the holy mount where the law was given and men were afraid to touch it because of the fire and the blackness of smoke and the fearful presence of God that literally because of what Jesus Christ has done, we're coming to a new covenant and to a better covenant that God has made with the people that couldn't keep the old covenant. And we can just go right up to the holy presence where God is and worship Him. And friend, do you know something? You and I today, we ought to be going up to the house of the Lord. And we're going to, we're going to look more at the events that come as a result of this promise or this covenant as we go through Isaiah. But this evening, I just want to talk just for a minute with you as we conclude our service tonight about fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that God has made it so that any person can come into His holy presence with nothing to fear, nothing to be afraid of, even when we have failed Him. You know, for Christians... When you're lost, you know, you feel like a lot of times... I mean, I know lost people that pray. And the reason they pray is because they don't have a concept of how holy God is. I'll be honest with you, if I were lost and I understood who God was, I wouldn't have the audacity to pray. Because I'd know. I'd know, listen, if I think that God has anything but judgment for me, <laughs> I'm not being realistic. But because Jesus died on the cross for my sins... That separation between me and God has been, has been fulfilled in the death of His Son. And because of the new covenant, the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm able to just have bold access to God. And God wants fellowship with me. I'll never go to God and have Him chide me and say, you know, I don't like you much. 
You've certainly failed me. I, you're not a good child. You're not a good son. He's not a God who would ever do that to anyone who come into His presence. He simply says, I love you and I've proved it with Calvary. Jesus paid it all. And that's where we stand today, my friend. And what we ought to be doing as a result is what Jesus told us to do. If you think about what happened when Jesus Christ had said it is finished and what it was transacted when Christ was risen from the dead, when He gave His last two words to His disciples, for instance, in Matthew 28, when He said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You know what? We ought to be knocking on people's doors and saying, let's go to the house of the Lord. Let's go, in, let's go to God in prayer. Let's go into the presence of God because God's not angry anymore. His wrath has been satisfied in the death of His Son. And we ought to be telling people about Jesus and we ought to be baptizing Him. And we ought to be getting people to the house of the Lord. I'm not using interchangeably the church house for the Lord's house. But the Bible does say where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. You know, a Christian who understands what God has done and what a miracle this assembly is here ought to be inviting everybody they encounter to it. You know, you ought to invite your friends to church. But more than that, you ought to invite your family. And more than that, you ought to invite your acquaintances. And in addition to that, you ought to invite just about anybody you meet. This morning, a man called me about a timeshare vacation. And Melissa and I just love timeshare vacations. We're just really... And so, you know, I was very happy to talk to him. But he was calling me from Fort Lauderdale. And uh, so, at the end of our conversation, you know, I don't remember how it happened, but I said, so you live in Fort Lauderdale? He said, yeah. I said, would you come to church? He said, well, you know what? I, I've been thinking I need, to, I need to do that. I need to get take care of some things. And I said, well, we want you to come. Told him where our church was. Invited him. And uh, said, you know, we, don't, we won't go. He was telling us we could do a six-day cruise. I said, do you have any cruises that aren't on Sunday? Because I don't... I don't miss church. He said, well, you could have church on, on the cruise ship. He said, no, I don't miss our church. I want to be in our church on Sunday. And then invited him to it. He said, let's go to the house of the Lord. Christian, you and I ought to do that. Somebody talks to you, you ought to, it ought to just drop off your tongue of, hey, let's fellowship with God. Do you know God loves you? Do you know God isn't angry with you? You know, you know if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, God will forgive you of your sins. Jesus died on the cross. Do you know you could pray and God would answer your prayers? Do you know that any problem you have could be satisfied in the person of Jesus Christ? You have something? Yes, you have to have Jesus. Yeah, God doesn't forgive a lost person's sins. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't have had to die. That's what the Bible says. Christ died in vain. Yeah, if if we don't need Jesus. So, Jesus didn't die in vain. So, yeah, no, God doesn't forgive. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so I know where you're at. You're, you're, going, you're all the way back where I, I said that um, I, if I were lost, I wouldn't have the audacity to pray to God. You know, the, the prayer that God, I believe that God, I'm not saying God no, doesn't no, hear no, the prayer I of sinners. I know, like, like, when I, like, when I do this prayer, yeah, you need Jesus. Yes. Yeah. Did you, forgiveness is found in Jesus in the payment of blood and hope. That's a good question. Thanks for asking it. Yeah. Let's go into the house of the Lord. And I think as believers, as we look at this passage of Scripture and we see the hope in it, there isn't just condemnation for Israel and her forsaking of God and her breaking of the covenant. There's a promise of a new covenant. And the new covenant is that all the nations, there's going to come a time, and God's, and we're not going to have to have the law that God gave Moses and wrote on tablets and parents are to teach their fathers are to teach their children. You won't have to teach your children anymore because God's going to put it in their heart. What a day that'll be. Right now it's a glorious day. Because Jesus has died for our sins and we've already seen the results of that new covenant, the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Father, thank you for what you've taught us this evening. I pray that on the basis of what we've seen in this snippet or this short portion of the Scripture, that, Lord, we would see and desire to worship, to come to the house of the Lord, to have fellowship with you. We thank you for what we've learned tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take prayer requests tonight, shall we?